And what I like about hypnosis is it is magic, but it is wrapped in science. And it's something that's been happening. Like the think of like a shamanic trance that is essentially hypnosis. So ever since humans have been able to speak, we've been able to shape our reality with our words. In fact, I, my personal belief is that all of this is held together with the stories that we tell ourselves and not just individual stories, but the collective story that humankind has been telling us. Joshua, thank you so much for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. I'm really excited to speak with you. How are you? I'm great, Jumi. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm excited. Yes, you know, I think the topic of hypnosis is something that I've always been intrigued by, but also a little bit skeptical, right? Because I'm like, can you really hypnotize people? How does that actually work, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, how do you really get people to like re release control and just go under or however people mm -hmm. um, describe hypnosis, right? So I want to get from you the official definition or what you would consider to be hypnosis and how did you get into hypnotherapy? Okay, so let's, gonna, I have to unwrap what you just said there a little bit. Uh, so first of all, I'll give you the definition of how I see hypnosis. Hypnosis is a relaxed, focused state. That's how I look at it. And, but a lot of times I like to take away the word hypnosis because there's so much wrapped up in that, which it, it's good when I go out and I introduce myself or I reach out to a podcast, they're like, Hey, hypnosis, that sounds interesting. But also there's all of these misunderstandings, expectations that aren't really correct. Like, like you just said, uh, putting you under, right? This is what we think of as hypnosis from all of the television shows we've seen, or maybe the performances that we've watched. The So the, the reason I like to take out the word hypnosis and I, what I replace it with is the word trance. That's what this really is. This is a state of trance, a relaxed, focused trance state. And the other thing to remember is we are in and out of different kinds of trance states all the time. Uh, in fact, you are probably in a podcasting host trance state right now, <laughs> right? I, and I know I'm a podcast host too. There's a certain way of being that you kind of step into when you're interviewing somebody. That happens with other things too. So that happens with the, the problem states that people have. Anxiety trance is a very common one. Worry trance. But you also get trance states like watching television. That's a trance state. We're just kind of staring at a flashing light on the wall, right? Um, you can get into a trance state driving. You drive and all of a sudden you realize you missed your exit. That's a driving trance. So the point of all this is that we're going in and out of trance states all the time. And hypnosis is a, uh, a intentional trance that gives us access in that relaxed, focused state to our internal resources that we always have available to us, but sometimes we forget. And so this is how we can heal. That's what it's all about is getting to that place where you can now heal yourself. Yes. And I actually want to quote something that you said that I pulled from your website. You said, hypnosis is a normal and natural state of mind you've experienced many times, similar to a daydream or getting lost in a good book or movie. And I yeah. think you kind of explained that with, you know, someone's driving, they could be in a drive, driving trance state, even me pod podcasting now, I'm in a, you know, podcast yeah. host trance state. So to really kind of make sure I fully understand what you're trying to describe, are you talking about just being lost in something like you're completely focused on that totally. one yep. thing? That's exactly what I'm talking about. And, and you know that this is true because you might be watching that flashing light on the wall and you're watching images and you're hearing sounds and all of a sudden you start crying because you're having an emotional experience, but you're not actually going through the thing that's on the screen. We're watching an actor go through a, an emotional moment, but we connect with that 
And in some levels, we are in that moment. That's why we're having that emotional experience. So it, it's, and, and so that's why I use kind of getting lost into that experience as a example of that, whether it's, it's a book where you get just totally engrossed in the, in the moment, whether it's meditation and you're just sitting in a position and you're in the moment again, right? That's really what it comes up to. What it comes to is when you're so engrossed in where you are right here and now that you can go somewhere else. <laughs> it's kind of the best way to describe it. Did you ever watch that movie Soul on Disney? Sold? Soul, S O U L. Oh, Soul. No, I have not. So what you're describing reminds me of a particular concept and scene in the movie where whenever someone is hyper focused on what they're doing, so they were kind of making an example with if you are so in love with making music for example so they had this guy playing the piano he loved music and he yeah. wrote music and he played music and every time he was playing the piano he would be in a trance and he would kind yes. of find himself on this different mental plane that probably was also physical as well but also invisible to us in this earth realm so it was a very cool um depiction of just being so in the flow, I think that's what they called it, being in the flow. So it yeah. kind of sounds similar to what you're describing. Yeah. And, you know, from a neuroscience point of view, because there is science behind it, we are calming the beta brain waves and bringing us down to an alpha state or even to a, a theta state. So that's the that's the deep trance theta state and a flow state it's kind of going down into theta, but then back up into beta, down into alpha, like a flow state kind of jumps back and forth, which is why you get those insights of creativity, but also you're in that relaxed, focused state at the same time. And is this different to meditation? I'm assuming that it is, but I would also assume that meditation is a form of being in a trance state as well. Do Is there some sort of correlation between meditation and hypnosis? It's similar. It's not quite the same, but it is very similar. And when you measure it, like similar things are happening, but you can tell there's differences between the two. Uh, the way that I experience it differently, because uh, I meditate pretty much every day for a length of time. I mean, not for a ton of time, but for enough time. And when I'm meditating, I'm just kind of focusing on my breath. I'm I'm being present in the moment. I don't usually listen to a guided recording. When you listen to a guided recording and you're meditating, that is way much more like hypnosis because now you're following the the trail of whatever the story that's being told or whatever the visualization is. With the kind of work that I do, it's it's kind of similar to that, but at the same time, we are. I am with my client in the in the moment with them, kind of following them in their trance, and I can help to guide them, and I can shift that, I can change that as needed, where if something might come up for them, because they're not just sitting there or laying there with their eyes closed, and I'm saying words. That is happening, but I'm also getting feedback from them. So I might have them describe to me what they're experiencing, and that will help shift the words that I give them next that keep that experience kind of growing and changing for them. Very interesting. And, you know, I know we're starting to creep into the notion and, and subject matter on hypnotherapy, and I want to talk about that and how you got into hypnotherapy because I think you have a very cool and interesting background. So I know that you have an extensive background in design within the corporate world, and you also have a background in magic. So can you just talk a little bit about your background and then how did you get into hypnotherapy? Yeah. For me, I, I developed an interest in hypnosis at about the age of 13 when I found a book in my school library. And it was really fascinating to me. My dad was a, uh, an amateur stage magician. So I kind of like liked all that stuff and had seen him practicing card games. And I knew some tricks and things like that. And this felt sort of similar, but different. 
the book basically taught me some very simple things like uh, what's called a um, progressive muscle relaxation. You've probably heard that. Most of the listeners probably have heard that term before, but that's where you relax from the top down or from the bottom up every muscle in your body just nice and slowly and by the time you get to the end you're probably asleep <laughs> and and that's essentially what i used it for was to just fall asleep at night or to feel a little bit more relaxed when i needed to take a test i promptly forgot about hypnosis as i grew up and uh and then i got intro but i was always interested in uh, the other side. And, you know, I, I played Dungeons and Dragons. And so I was very visual in my imagination telling stories. I like to kind of be the one making up the stories for people, which is kind of like what a hypnotist does. And we're all, but we're all in this hypnotic trance together. Right. And uh, over time uh, I kind of became a young adult and had some really challenging relationship moments and felt totally out of control. Like I felt like my life was out of control. And that was when I started to get interested in magic. And there was a, a bookstore across the, my work that was a, uh, a used occult bookstore. And so I would go there pretty much every day and find some new book and just, we got fascinated by the idea. And, and so I practiced some relatively simple things. Um, and then I kept living life. So at about the age of 35, I found my myself really stuck. All this time, I had been practicing different magical acts, trying to better my life. But at the same time, I was really frozen by fear. And I was afraid to put myself out there. I was afraid to try new things. I was afraid to tell people that I didn't know something. Like I would literally pretend I knew everything that everybody ever talked about. And I learned nothing, <laughs> but I didn't want to like be stupid or whatever it was in my mind. I was really afraid of all that stuff. And uh, all this time, I'm basically not really making choices in life and kind of letting life just take me this way and that way. And really felt like I was a victim. So that there was a moment when I was 30, I'm 35 and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm waking up out of a trance and I'm holding the torn, destroyed remains of a wicker basket that I just kicked to pieces, destroyed it in, in rage. And, uh, my wife had told me that, uh, she was done. She had found somebody else. She was done. And I, uh, and my, I had five kids at the time and they were all sleeping in the room kind of right next to me, but I knew they had just heard everything. They had heard my rage. I, I had been angry more than that. That wasn't the first time. So, and I knew this was a problem and she's like going to leave. And this is, this my, life is not working out the way I wanted it to. My sister suggests I take this workshop and uh, it was a landmark forum. You've probably heard of landmark forum, but it's essentially a weekend workshop that really shakes you out of your stuckness and you start to get new perspectives on things, shifting your perspective, right? So, and it worked really well to shift my perspective. What the biggest thing that I got from that was there is no meaning to anything in life except the meaning that we give to things. And we get to choose that meaning ourselves. And that blew my mind. <laughs> and it started me on this path of making choices. I, I had been working as a graphic designer and I had this job that I thought was this amazing job that I always wanted, but it was eating away my soul. It wasn't, it wasn't working for me. I, I was living in this town that I grew up in that I never wanted to live in, but I was there for 20 years. <laughs> living in a, a house I didn't want to buy, but I owned it for 20 years. Um, and in this marriage that was just falling apart, it was not a good fit. It was hadn't been a good fit for a long, long time. So I made choices. I, I filed for divorce. I quit smoking. I got a job close to my kids that was in line with my values in an organic food company. Um, I 
started getting involved with the community, which I had ostracized myself because I wasn't like them. Like all these things that I had stopped myself from doing, I started doing, but I didn't have hypnosis. So it was very like, just kind of like pummel my way forward, which is a way to make change, but it's hard and it takes a long time. And it took me about 10 years to basically pull myself out of this pit I had dug for myself over 15 years. At the end of that 10 years, I had kind of taken my life where I was, you know, where I, where it could go in that town. And I wanted to move from, I was living in Southwest Wisconsin at the time. And I wanted to move up to the twin cities where I live now, Minnesota, about four hours away. I still had a couple of kids in high school. They didn't want to come with me. I was really uh, it was really important to me to be a dad and to be there for them. And again, all that fear came up. I went and saw a hypnotist and she helped me realize it doesn't matter if I go, I, I can still set my life up to support my kids and to be there for them. And yes, it's going to be a little bit more challenging, but it's not impossible. And that worked so well that I realized if I could do this for, for a living and help other people empower their lives, get past their own stuckness in less than the 10 years it took me, that would be the most empowering way I, I could think of to live. So then I, I found a mentor. I started working with him. I, I worked with him for about a year and a half, started seeing friends and family and coworkers. And uh, about a year after that, I had built up the business enough to go full-time and been full-time since 2018. You said so much there. There's so <laughs> many things I want to touch on. I don't even know where to start. I mean, honestly, in your story, I heard two distinct things, right? One, kind of touching on the power of the mind and how yeah. we shape our reality. And also, as you were talking, it made me remember this podcast that I listened to called Hidden Brain. And they had an episode where they were talking about um, a contamination story versus a redemptive story, right? And it kind of ties back in again to what stories are we telling ourselves? And a contamination yeah. story could be synonymous to being in victimhood and feeling like you don't have any power over your life and just kind of literally sleeping through life not literally like not literally but figuratively and then the redemptive story the redemptive arc is when the person um the protagonist in their own story wakes up and realizes actually i have a lot more control and it all starts with my mind the mind is yeah. such a powerful thing and i want to dive deeper into the mind but before we dive deeper i want to know what hypnotherapy is. So we talked about hypnosis, right? And kind of being in a trance state, but hypnotherapy mixes hypnosis, obviously, but the therapeutic part of it is to get someone to, for example, I know you work with people to release anxiety, um, release um, self-doubt or self-sabotage. So can you talk about that a little bit and how you work with clients to release those things? Yeah, for sure. These those different things that you just talked about, whether that's anxiety or self doubt or uh, even a, a phobia like fear of driving or flying, in the brain these are pathways, and this can be measured. There's neuroscience behind all of this. Those pathways are literal pathways, neurons connected to neurons with synapses to create a path. Those types of pathways are created all the time. You, many of them, like the most powerful ones, tend to be uh, created around an emotional situation. So something highly emotional happens, and we, most of the time, it happens when we're young, when we're, when we're kids. And it can happen any time in life, but a lot of times these things happen when we're kids. So something highly emotional, you could call it traumatic if you want. I I prefer a highly emotional past experience because it's actually more truthful to what it is. So something happens. As kids, we don't know what's going on. We don't understand life. So we make something up. We make up things like, well, I guess I don't matter. And we create this pathway. 
And what the brain does is it is looking for those pathways because it wants to be efficient and it wants to use as little energy as possible. So it looks for pathways that are getting used. Anxiety is a great example. So something happens in life, scary maybe, or, or, or a little bit scary when we're kids, emotion comes up, we feel anxiety, we get away from that situation. Oh, we're okay. We're safe. Safe means we didn't die. <laughs> and so the brain goes, okay, well, let's store that. A little while later, something else kind of similar happens. Anxiety comes up. Oh, remember we did that thing before and we stayed safe. Okay. We'll do that again. Oh yeah, it worked. I, I didn't die again. Great. Every time that gets used, it gets stronger. This is a concept called neuroplasticity, right? When the brain uses these pathways, it gets stronger and stronger. Well, eventually that one kind of situation where anxiety worked, it works so well that the brain starts to map that across other areas until usually by the time somebody comes to see me, they feel anxiety in a lot of different situations that the brain has mapped these all across. With hypnotherapy, what we are doing is healing that, changing the way the brain is working, and literally rewiring those pathways. Uh, and we do lots, we do that in lots of different ways. Obviously, we go into a hypnotic state, which can be deep or light, it doesn't matter. Like you don't have to be, you, you aren't unconscious in hypnosis. And you, a lot of times I will guide somebody into a deep state, but sometimes I can just have them close their eyes and they just naturally go into that state. Like we have access to our imagination, whether or not we walk down a flight of stairs very slowly. And I say 10, nine, eight and all that stuff. Right. Or if you just close your eyes, you can also just imagine things. And that's honestly hypnosis too just not what we think of it as hypnosis. So we, we go into a hypnotic state, deeper light, and then we use different processes. And those can be imagination, visualization. They can be uh, working with memories. They might be working with different aspects of us. Uh, I might have you just uncover a metaphor that is related to the problem. And we use that to help go past it. Like, uh, it, like, if, if if you could imagine that your challenge was uh, a block of some sort, what would that be like? And then they'll it'll pop up for you. Well, what would you like to do with that? Well, I'd like to smash it down with a hammer. Okay, what happens when you do that? There's a path in front and I can just walk down the path, right? Things like that just kind of unfold when we go into that hypnotic state and we give ourselves permission to think differently. From a neuroscience point of view, it's even simpler. We are talking about your problem. That activates the pathway, the problem pathway. We use these processes to send those neurons down a different pathway. And we do that over and over again to rewire the brain, to change how you're feeling in the moment. So I'm assuming that probably takes several sessions. That wouldn't just be yeah. a one and done type of thing. It's it's not a one and done. Like you, you've been... Uh, building this pathway for your lifetime and it would be it would be uh, false of me to tell you that you can eliminate it in a single session although that can happen and typically even after a first session people are starting to get some traction and some changes happening because outside of like the work that i just described i also give people lots of different ways of lots of different tools, things they can do themselves that are not hypnotic, but are neuroscience based uh, ways to calm the nervous system, to get out of a fight or flight response, to get out of your head and into your body. And, and those things can go a long way. Like those are like the ways that we start to have control ourselves and we don't have to feel like a victim all the time. Mm, that's good. You know, it's so interesting. My, concept of hypnosis was from you know when you would go to a show and someone has a couple people on stage and they're like mm -hmm. I'm gonna put you in a trance and as soon as I snap my fingers you're going to start making 
cow noises or something silly. And then the person yeah. um, starts doing those things and then they snap their finger again. And it's like, oh, they don't even re realize what happened. But, you know, in talking with you about this, obviously, I know it's not you're you're not doing the caricature version of hypnosis, but it, I'm saying all of this to say that it's just so interesting how much power lies within the mind right and to yeah. me it almost comes off like magic being able to get people into these states and have certain thought pathways and certain patterns or behaviors or decisions that they are so used to making all of a sudden shift right um and what's interesting why i brought up that example as well is that it seems like the person has still has control they still have they know what's going on, right? Um, so which is good to know, because I'm sure people listening to this, again, might have had the same perception I did, where it's like, oh, someone puts you in a trance, they can, they hijack your brain. And then when they want to unhijack your brain, they snap their fingers. But yeah. that's not all hypnosis is. And it goes way beyond that and has really good benefits for people who choose to go into hypnotherapy specifically. But speaking about the mind, right? Are you, we talked about neural pathways. So I know that there are three levels to the mind. For example, we have the unconscious, the subconscious, and then the conscious, right? So are you hacking the unconscious mind? Are you hacking the subconscious mind? And I just a level set for the listeners, right? How I think about the unconscious mind is that part of us that is kind of, um, automated like we don't we're so used to doing things a certain way we're not even aware that we're doing certain things it's just automated within us and then the subconscious mind to me um kind of influences influences the unconscious I guess they all influence each other but I think of the subconscious mind as a part of our brain that houses a lot of pivotal moments in our lives that affect us in a way that we might not be privy to and then the consciousness piece of the mind is the awareness. That's the part of us that if we're able to connect with, we can most of the time map out our actions and kind of wake up to how we're living our lives. We're more conscious to and more intentional with how we're moving through life. And you can let me know if I have that correct or not. Uh-huh, sure. Um, but long story short, so with hypnotherapy, what part of the mind are we really interacting with? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So there's, first of all, there is no way to determine what is the subconscious mind? What is an unconscious mind? These are essentially metaphors that humans have created for these different experiences that we have, right? I, I like to look at it a little bit differently. So for me, there is the conscious mind. This is the awake part of us. This is more like the the ego kind of mind, right? The, the one who wants to be famous. <laughs> like that's the conscious mind. The and then I, I and then the le the next layer I look at as the unconscious mind. And it's these are just different semantics, right? The to me, the unconscious mind is the part of us that is the automatic response, whether that's automatic part of our body or the automatic reaction when a trigger moment happens. So it's the part of us that holds those moments that you're talking about. And then the, the next part I think of as the deeper mind. And that is, then we're going to get a little spiritual here. That is that spark of the greater consciousness that is housed within all of us. So that is us at our highest potential, right? When when we are living full out as a fully activated human being that is not thrown this way or that way by those unconscious habits, beliefs, and behaviors, that's the part of us that is, if we didn't have any of those things and we were just like a, a spirit floating through, that's who we are, that uh, spark of the greater consciousness expressing itself through our body that's how i look at it thank you and i love getting spiritual so would you say that when you have someone in a trance state you're trying to get to that spark that deeper mind that you were talking about i i'm often help helping them connect with that part of them or at least making it more real for them 
Um, you know, and you can think of that like bringing in your guides or having your ancestors come in. Like it's all very similar ideas, just maybe a different kind of wrapper to the idea, right? Yeah. And and what I like about hypnosis is mm -hmm. it is magic, but it is wrapped in science. And it's something that's been happening, like the think of like a shamanic trance. That is essentially hypnosis. So ever since humans have been able to speak, we've been able to shape our reality with our words. In fact, I my personal belief is that all of this is held together with the stories that we tell ourselves mm -hmm. and not just individual stories, but the collective story that humankind has been telling us. And the story gets bigger and bigger as we can see further into the universe. Yes, I 100% agree with you because I had someone on the show too um who was he was a he's a past life regressionist. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Dolores Cannon and Oh yeah, um, sure. Yeah. So he has a similar I think he got a certification from her organization. I think it's called QHHT and he kind of does something similar to what you do, right? But like you said, um everybody has a different way of of going about it, but he taps into people's past lives and kind of takes a look at their karmic I don't know if you believe in karma or any of that stuff but kind of takes a look at their karmic blueprint and the journey that they've had in past lives because some people say that some of the things some of the phobias that we might have or some of the things that kind of hinder us to reaching our fullest potential some of that is not necessarily created in this reality it's it's probably created from a past life right so he kind mm -hmm. of goes uh, I think it's a pretty deep trance what he does to yeah. uncover some of these memories from past lives so it's just all very very fascinating and I want to kind of dive deeper into the mind right so we're gonna get a little bit more philosophical and spiritual here <laughs> which I'm very excited about so what are your beliefs about the mind so you kind of kind of gave us a sneak peek right so you talked about what you went through and how you were viewing your world. And then you had a breakthrough moment and realized that you can kind of change, like start taking new action, make new decisions. You work with a hypnotherapist and I think you've unlocked new levels of your mind and you were able to control your life. But I, I kind of want to hear a little bit deeper with the work that you do. How do you view the mind? Because I think the world is mental, right? So kind of what we talked about right before we started recording um, hermetic philosophy. One of the first principles yeah. is that the world is mental. So I just threw a lot at you there, but I just want to hear if you have any sort of deeper insights or thoughts on the mind and the mentalism of this reality that we live mm. in. I mean, I do have lots of thoughts around that and... First of all, it's impossible to know what the truth is. And ultimately, my personal belief is that there really isn't any truth. We create that truth. And so we get to decide what that is, right? That was that insight that came from uh, the landmark forum for me. But I look at the mind, if I think about it, like the way you just asked me, I think about it like a, a filter. and because we're taking in information of, and really from my experience has told me that all of this around us is energy. And actually science tells us that too, at it's at the smallest level, there's pure energy. And that's when you break everything down, you're down to some, you're down to energy and all of this, everything is made up with my desk back there, this microphone, like everything at its core is energy and is moving like it's literally active this uh so i guess my point is that like we're surrounded by all of this energy and the, this brain filtered filtering through the through our eyes our senses is what puts together the pieces that we experience as the consensus reality that we're all in right now so to me the that's what the brain is it's just kind of this filtering mechanism that takes all of the senses that 
our or sensory organs are sending us and makes some kind of sense out of it, which might be different to you than it is for me, there's no way to know because you can't be in me. And so we, we can't understand what is happening and we can try with words and things like that, but still the, it's a subjective experience. We're all within our own subjective experience. And I don't know, to, to me, the, that's the best way that I can think of to describe it. I a hundred percent agree with you. And part of the reason why I wanted to start a podcast called shifting dimensions um, was to curate conversations that could get us closer to what the objective truths are, right? Because to your point, I do believe that we are all projecting our own version of reality and everyone thinks their reality is the true reality, right? So then you get to this juncture where you're like, okay, what is the truth, right? And I always say where I've landed on this right now is that everyone, like there's a picture, right? And it's uh everyone has a different puzzle piece and they think their puzzle piece is the whole picture but it's like no i actually need to put my picture my puzzle down uh, my puzzle piece down you need to put yours down and we need to create this unified image right so i think what you said rings so true to how i see things as well is just that what really is reality i think reality is what we create in our minds and like you said everything that we have everything that we are seeing in this world is held together from what we have stories. in our mind right our stories as well which is I think is so fascinating because there have been moments in my life where I had a specific perception of something or someone and then all of a sudden it feels like that reality is just so untrue I can no longer relate to it that yeah. constantly shifting. So anyways, that was just me rambling a lot. But do you feel like there are objective truths, right? So we just talked about like, we all have our own version of what we consider to be true. But do you think that there are certain things in this world that are just objectively true without any sort of interpretation? I don't. Mm -hmm. That's a hard question because someone could ask. That's an easy question. <laughs> but you okay so playing devil's advocate right because someone could ask you know um when we talk about violence for example yeah is it an objective truth that violence is wrong some people might argue that violence is wrong and then some people might argue that it's not an objective truth that violence is wrong because sometimes people need to protect themselves right um I mean, look even a little bit larger than that because mm -hmm. throughout the universe, stars are exploding and tearing apart whole solar systems. That's pretty violent. That's Is true. that wrong that that's happening? Wow. That's true. Right? I mean, yeah. trees fall over and they smash a whole ecosystem of insects and birds are killing other like raptors are killing rabbits to eat this is i mean i i understand what you're saying right like now we're talking about morality which is not a truth it is something that we're placing on it's kind of like a law that we create for ourselves so we can live in a human existence so this is a truth we're creating for ourselves a law maybe not a truth, but a law that we're creating for ourselves that we, uh, you can only be violent in certain situations. And if it's outside of that situation, then it's wrong. But I mean, we, are you a meat eater? Yes, I am. So you have <laughs> to kill the animal to eat yeah. the meat. Is that violent? I would say that's probably violent. Yeah, some would argue that is violent. Yeah. I mean, you just made such an excellent point where when you talked about nature and also like the universe, that is such an ex excellent point because there is a lot of quote unquote violence within creation and, and nature. Um, so can violent is violence inherently wrong, right? And like you said, now we start talking about morality and that 
in and of itself could also be subjective. But I think this is the part that I think get a lot of people overwhelmed, right? And I think this is what gets people so fixated on their belief systems or having a set of rules that they can abide by because I've had conversations with people where I'm like, yeah, but you know, there's no such thing as the ultimate truth. And that freaks a lot of people out because then what do we have to hold on to? Then what is the purpose of being a good person or, and not to be dramatic, but those are some of the thoughts, yeah. right? Um, if everything goes and every, every anybody can make an argument for this could be true or this is a possibility, then how do we, how can we agree on a collective truth of what's good or bad, if that makes any sense? I just think people need to feel grounded. And I think sometimes with these conversations, people get a little weary because it's like, so are you telling me that my reality could potentially be incorrect? And that scares people. Yeah. To, to even think does. about that. It does scare people. And and um you don't need a moral code or a set of laws to act in a way that is good for a collective we know what is right like even though even though my belief i'll put it that way is that nothing is true that doesn't mean that i am going to go out and kill my neighbor I'm, I like humans. I like being part of, of this whole thing and exploring life. I'm like, I am not an inherently violent. I mean, I eat meat, so I guess I am violent because I do that. But, but other than that, I'm a relatively peaceful person that in, enjoys life and enjoys loving people and, and being part of something bigger than myself. And most people are like that. We don't need... In fact, the people that are out there doing violent acts, a lot of times they will be followers of all of the laws that tell us not to do certain things and they'll still do them. So you don't, it's just because you have a set of laws that you're supposed to follow doesn't mean you actually follow them. There's nothing that stops you from following laws. What is it? What do you feel like in your heart? is the right thing to do in a situation and just do that because you're probably just going to be kind to each other. Yeah, that's, that's very true. And, you know, even kind of going back to talk about the mind, I think one thing that has been one of the biggest breakthroughs for me in understanding that everyone is just projecting their own version of reality. So for example, just again, to level set for the audience, you know, I could kick you and tell you, oh my God, that was an accident. From my perspective, it was an accident. But from you, depending on what filters you have on and how you see the world, it could be like, here's someone else is hurting me again. Nobody cares about me, et cetera, right? So yeah. in understanding how deep the mind and how powerful it is and how we are all kind of living on our own individual planets, it has helped me to not take things personal. Like when mm -hmm. someone does something to me, not to say I shouldn't hold people accountable or stand up for myself in situations where I need to, but the mental anguish that it normally would have caused me or caused me has a lot of that has been released. And it also makes me want to ask, like, I know you work with clients on anxiety and self-limiting beliefs and giving them tools to be more empowered and becoming the best version of themselves. But are there limitations to hypnosis? Can you get someone to rethink trauma, for example, right? Because mm. yeah. I know that you also talk about shadow work being integrated in your work sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to me, short answer, yes, hypnosis can help with trauma and it's not something that you have to re-experience to go through it. There's ways to uh, heal that without having to have another traumatic experience again. Shadow work is all of this. Like shadow work is integrating the parts of us that we just don't like. So for me, that anger part, right? That part of me that was 
angry and felt frustrated and felt trapped in the situation and was kind of reaching out or, or like uh, reaching out is the wrong word, uh, acting out by getting angry. That was the part that I needed to, I needed to come together with and I needed to be okay with. And because it's a, it's a powerful part of us, the, the anxiety is the same way or uh, all those parts that those pieces of us that show up in those trigger moments, they really just need to be loved. And that's what shadow work is, is loving all of the parts of us, the the good parts, the parts that we label as bad parts, loving them all to integrate them all, to be a whole person, which is kind of what you just described, like being able to get kicked and take a step back to realize, oh, that had nothing to do with me. That wasn't just an accident. That's healing. That's living in a conscious way instead of in an unconscious way. Right. And is hypnosis, hypnotherapy, is it permanent? So let's say I was coming to you because I struggle with anxiety and I have, I don't know, eight to 10 sessions with you and I'm able to significantly reduce my anxiety because obviously different things can trigger us. But mm -hmm. is hypnosis, is this a long term solution? Because I could have anxiety around my job and I work with you and I release that anxiety. Something else might come up in my life to start to cause anxiety. So does it look at the whole picture? I, I'm trying to make sure I yeah, formulate for my, sure. my, com my question correctly. I don't know if you're understanding what I'm trying to say, but I, do you I think what you're asking me is uh, if we, if we focus on this one area on anxiety, does it, does it fix everything related to anxiety? Yes. So it's a, it's a little bit more complicated than that. I mean, Short answer is it helps. It may not eliminate it in every situation, but typically the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. And so if we focus over here on this anxiety, it does spread across to all these other areas. Because remember, we're taking this pathway that's been grooved into the brain. It's like a super highway and we're breaking it apart, tearing it down, building a new pathway. And that's, so as we're using neuroplasticity to build this new pathway, it becomes the path of, path of least resistance. It becomes a new superhighway. This one might still be a little bit of a trail here and it's very comfortable, it's familiar. So it's easy to kind of slip into that sometimes. But once you've done this work, you can start to recognize, oh, that's right, I'm doing that again. Well, let's come back over here to this pathway. When I'm working with somebody, I am giving them tools and those include the hypnosis work that we're doing. If I'm doing my job right, I'm working myself out of a job because I'm teaching people how to do this work themselves. And those are the people that have the best results are the ones that, that take the work we do, take the ideas that are coming up and they run with them and they learn to do them themselves. I like what you said, if you're doing your work right, then you'd be working yourself out of a job because you're trying to teach people how to do this themselves. And uh, something else I've come to realize is that a lot of, and I'm not a psychologist, but this is just my theory at the moment. And it's not a blanket statement, but I've come to realize that a lot of anxiety and depression and angst that people feel within themselves usually stems from not giving themselves permission to do what they want to do with their lives. Mm. Right. And it could be as basic as maybe not being in that relationship, not being in that job, pursuing a different career, traveling or expressing their ideas or, you know, going against the grain. And I find that a lot of times what causes people so much suffering is because they are trying to fit into a life that no longer fits yeah. them. That describes me in my mid thirties for sure. And it's like stepping out of your comfort zone, right? I the, So my method, it was a little bit of a weird method. My method was I just started to follow my curiosity. And one of the things that I got curious about was performing. So I told you, I started getting involved with my community. One of the ways that I did that was I uh, did some murder mystery dinner theater 
like I, I, uh, I hosted these and kind of made them happen. And it was a way of raising money for my kids, for their school, for the drama department. Cause I was, you know, interested in all of that. I eventually we did a, a show that had a, uh, it had like a circus sideshow element to it. And I learned to eat fire for this performance. And I was fascinated by, oh, this is really amazing. The sideshow art. I found myself a mentor and I trained with a, a world famous sideshow artist for, uh, and then built out a show that toured around the Midwest for about 10 years. So the reason I'm telling you all of this is these are, so sideshow is like eating fire, laying on a bed of nails, escaping from a straight jacket, walking on broken glass. All of those are traditional sideshow acts. And they're all relatively easy to do, except you have to get past your mind. It's relatively easy to lay on a bed of nails. In fact, there's a lot of science behind that because there are so many nails that when you lay on it, no one nail takes up that much pressure and it's uncomfortable but it's not going to hurt you. It, nothing pokes through you. You never bleed. But you have to get past this idea that I'm going to lay on these nails. Broken glass is the same kind of thing. It's It actually doesn't feel hard at all when you do it, but you're putting bare feet on a bunch of broken glass, eating fire. If you know the techniques, it's not hard, but you're still shoving a burning flame into your face. So the point, I, the point of all of this is what I was doing for myself was I was teaching myself to face fear. And then I was teaching people that were watching the show, they can do this too, because these are all relatively simple things. And I would teach kids, I've taught thousands of kids how to lay on a bed of nails and there's this beautiful moment when I I, I kind of help lower them down and they're looking at me and they're afraid, but they're trying to relax. And I, I tell them to take a breath when they're laying on the bed of nails and they take this breath and then their eyes change. They realize I did this. I can do this. And it, it's this amazing experience to watch all these children realize they can do more than they thought they ever could by just teaching them how to lay on a bed of nails. That's beautiful. That was an amazing story, actually. And I, I had all of the imagery in my mind, picturing someone lay on a bed of nails or step on glass. I'm like, oh, my God, that seems so daunting. But like you said, when you do it, it's easy, but you have to get over. You have the to get mind. over the fear. You have yeah. to get over the, the fear. Everything starts from the mind, which I think is, Again, just so fascinating. And I have to ask you, because I ask this question to all of my guests, especially with the work that you do, it seems like you're obviously constantly reflecting or having deep, you're in deep thought, probably you think deeply about a lot of things, I right? I do, yeah. So what do you think the purpose of life is? And again, that's a loaded question. I just want to hear your perspective, because to your point about like, nothing is real everything's real but not real at the same time right mm -hmm. everything could be true but nothing's true at the same time so why do you think we're here like what do you think the purpose of this reality is my my thought my belief around that is the purpose of this reality is to experience this reality in all of its full exploration the the good stuff, the negative stuff. So if you think about it as if, if we are universal consciousness, so we already talked about that spark of consciousness, right? We are all this spark of consciousness. This is what I believe anyway. You can believe something different, but I believe we are all this spark of consciousness. And when we're in the consciousness, like the bigger consciousness, it's like pure bliss. It's, it's something that is unexplainable to us now, but when we're in it, it's just, it's everything. It's like everything that's ever happened, everything that's ever will happen, all happening at once. And it's just this blissful joy, love, pure love. It's kind of boring. And so this great consciousness wants to experience the physical reality. 
because it's in the energy. The energy is just the energy. And it's, like I said, it's this universal love. So to do that, it has to break up into these little sparks and go into a physical medium, us as an example, but probably trees and pieces of grass and everything, everything that is existing, suns, planets, all of it, any, anything that has anything that's physical is also energy. And that energy has that spark in it. So my belief is that that spark is coming through us so that it can experience the full range of what the physical plane can give it, which again, the hard stuff, the good stuff. In fact, it wants to feel the, the stuff that we're considering negative, but to the spark, it's just, it's just a feeling. And if you think about it in the body, it's literally just a physical feeling within the body. We label it with emotions, but if you take away the label, all you have left is a feeling in the body. Anxiety, your heart's racing, your palms are sweating. Maybe there's this kind of thing in your gut that you're feeling. Well, that's the exact same feeling as excitement. It's just a matter of what's the label that you're putting on the feeling. Somebody who is going to stand up in front of a bunch of people and speak could choose, I'm feeling anxious about this, or I'm feeling excited about this. And whichever frame they want to put on that feeling in the body is what they get in the mind. It's interesting. I've heard people say the same thing quite a few times. So I think to my mind, I'm like, oh, okay, well, God just got bored. And I was like, oh, let's see what <laughs> these <laughs> let's these Let's see what I created okay, here. <laughs> let's see what all of this is. And it's like, okay, well, you've learned now. Like, can we uh, wrap this up? Just just kidding. Anyways, um, I think that was a... <laughs> I think that was a great uh, perspective. I really enjoyed that so much. This has been such a great conversation and thank you for indulging all of the different rabbit holes that we kind of went through briefly. Um, I really enjoyed it. Thank you yeah, so absolutely, much. Absolutely, Jumi. It's been fun. <laughs> yeah, it's been fun. So I have to ask one last question. It's a fun question to kind of wrap this all up and is, have you shifted in perspective on anything recently? And it could be as lighthearted as you want it to be, or it could be as deep as you want it to be. Um, yeah, I, I have a lot of shifting happening that's all around relationships with me right now and uncovering a lot of old stories that I thought were important that are not important, but I thought they were. And so there's been a lot of, I've had a lot of growth in the last couple of months as I'm exploring that and a lot of challenges. But luckily for me, I have lots of tools <laughs> And uh, if it's okay, I'd like to share one of those tools with with your audience. Absolutely. Please go ahead. So one of the things that I have really wanted to do is have a, uh, a, a simple, basically a low cost or free way even for people to get a transformational experience. Because sometimes it's a little daunting to reach out to whether it's a hypnotist or a therapist or somebody who's doing any kind of those healing modalities. And, and uh, so what I've done is I, I have a, it's basically an hour long session that I, like if we were going to do it now, I could run you through this probably in about 30 minutes and we could transform a fear, a worry, or an anxiety in your life in that amount of time. Hard to do that without me being there. So what I did is I created a seven day program that runs you through this experience using just emails and and a couple of audios so if if that's you think that would be of value to your listeners oh absolutely so if you go to xfactorhypnosis.com slash shift that's going to take your listeners to uh, a page to uh, have that experience however uh, there's one caveat to this this requires engagement mm -hmm. so this isn't like all of the other email things that you do where you sign up for it and you get to it later. If you sign up for it, you need to be involved. You need to put energy into it. And if you don't put energy into it, I boot, I boot you out because it's not any point in being in it. If you're just going to be there as a consumer, this is about making a transformation in your life. So 
If that's you, go to xfactorhypnosis.com slash shift and transform your life. That's amazing. So is it sort of like a virtual hypnosis program or is it more of people watching videos and you give them, giving them tools to rewire their brain or start to think in a different way to release anxiety or fear, for example. Yeah, it's literally taking a one-hour hypnosis session that I would do with somebody, which would include some kind of conversation and kind of understanding where they're at, giving them some tools, understanding how they do a problem, finding out where it comes from, and then transforming that. So it's it's basically a session, but it's blocked out in seven days, mainly because I wanted to make it simple. So Every day, there's something really small, just a, a simple task to do, but there's a task to do and you have to like do it. And I know if you've done it or not. And then if you do it, then you go to the next day and then you do the next little task there and you go to the next day and it's going to run you through, uh, a, like I said, real simple process. But at the end, uh, you're going to have a hypnosis experience. So there is a recording that's going to walk you through a transformational experience. And then the, the final thing is in the arguably the most important piece is we're going to take what you got from that session and we're going to integrate it into your life so that it, which makes it solid, grounds it into your reality, into your story. Oh, that's amazing. And do people have access to you? So if they sign up for the program and you're, they're getting, yeah, I'm, I'm an email away. In fact, that's it. I, very, I, this is about transformation first and foremost. So if anybody, if you, if you're starting this and you're like, I'm getting stuck, in fact, I'm going to reach out to you multiply, multiple times if I notice you're getting stuck. If you get stuck, you just respond to the email and I'm there. I, I, I'm on the other side of those emails. So this okay. is not like a fully automated thing that I don't even know what's happening. I, I know everybody that comes in. I see them come in. I'm tracking them. I'm making sure that they're getting what they need. Is this just for mental health or it could be a shift in anything that anyone is looking for or is it catered to people who are dealing with anxiety or fear what about people, people... have used it for all kinds of things okay. um any kind of thing that triggers you okay. right so if you're in a moment and you get triggered that's a great thing to use this process for because because that trigger is likely related to lots of other times when you get triggered so if we can pull out that charge so now that moment can happen and you really like you can make a different choice you can you can respond the way you want to instead of just automatically reacting. Okay. Well, that sounds very cool and interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that with the guests. I'm sorry, with the listeners. And where else can people find you? So, you know, outside of your website, where can I know you have a podcast? Yep. Where can people find you on? So social my podcast, media well? my podcast is called Super States. We explore some similar things to you, but really we're exploring consciousness and altered states of consciousness in particular, I like to focus in on hypnosis, obviously. That's that's a, one of the ways. Uh, psychedelics is another way of altering your consciousness. Sex is another way. And then breath work. So those are kind of the four bigger buckets. And sometimes I talk to other people as well. I've had people, musicians come in, uh, witches have come in. Like there's lots of ways to talk about altered states. Uh, so that's one way, superstatespodcast.com. If you go to xfactorhypnosis.com and like everything is there, there is a link to my podcast there. The The free program is is there as well. Uh, if, you, if you're into social media, I'm on basically all the social medias using at Joshua Ray Peters, and that's R-E-Y. That take that, like I'm on... YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, TikTok, I think all of those in there. And I'm sharing a lot of different pieces of the podcast, but also different tools that can help people make shifts in their own dimensions. <laughs> I love that. I love the pun. Thank you so much, Joshua, for stopping by the Shifting Dimensions podcast. It's been great speaking with you. It's been fantastic, Jumi. Thanks for having me.